Jesus Christ, the one who came to teach, heal, suffer, die, and rise from the grave only three days later, the one who ascended into heaven, and whose final words to his disciples were to go and make disciples of all nations. Immediately they began embarking on the great journey that was set out before them. They taught in his name, began building the first church, and coordinate the first missionary journeys. They helped the oppressed, stood up to the heretics, and through the grace of God, befriended their worst enemies. They were sojourned, they were poor, and they suffered more than most. They were common men who had no business carrying out the teachings of Jesus other than the direct orders from the Messiah himself. The new church began to form. New believers were being called to Christ every day, and the Great Commission was being fulfilled. This is their story. These are their acts. Amen. What a great time of worship this morning, and how awesome to hear about our uh, go tour. Will you think for a moment about the two that gave testimony this morning, and do you know who they are? Uh, Drew, the first one that shared is Drew Shaw. Uh, his dad, uh, John Shaw, uh, was a wonderful friend and a man who grew up in our church with a heart for missions and sharing the gospel, was a deacon and minister of our church. And John passed away with cancer, and now uh, Emily, uh, John's mother, is married to another godly man, Daryl Hester. But uh, Drew's, what I say? John, thank you, baby. Drew's mother, Emily. Can I get it right this time? Uh, and so uh, you see the, the impact of family. You see the impact of a father who loves the Lord, a father who has a heart for doing the work of ministry and that being passed into the life of a son. And then Kenley Gibson, uh, Kenley Gibson is John and Mary Gibson's daughter. And of course we know John and Mary. John heads up our uh, Serving You Ministry, a mission in ministry, and here's a daughter following suit. I just, in my heart, my heart's just leaping for joy to see families and how the faith and the commitment to Christ and the ministry of Christ is transferred down from one generation to another. And I know John in heaven would have been so proud of you, Drew, and love you, man. Love, love our church. Love what God is doing. And just want to invite you, if you're new to our church, uh, next Sunday we have our Next Steps class. If you've been coming to our church for a while, uh, our Next Steps class, or for those of you who may want to know what the next step is, how do I get involved? How do I join? Well, next Sunday at 10.30, during the 10.30 hour, we'll have our Next Steps class. We'd love for you to attend uh, from 10.30 to noon. At noon, we'll have a lunch, a free lunch, with you and our staff. And if, you, if God so uh, leads you, you can actually join the church. So I invite you, come and be a part of that. Well, this morning, we're going to continue what we started last Sunday, our study of the book of Acts. Open your Bible to Acts chapter 1. And uh, we started this series on Easter Sunday last week. We talked about the proofs of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I can't tell you how excited I am to preach through the book of Acts. I think I'm as giddy about preaching through the book of Acts as I was years ago when I preached through the book of Revelation for the very first time. But we're going to go all the way through the book of Acts. Starting with chapter 1, we're going to go all the way through for several months. We're going to learn a lot of amazing things from this great book of the Bible. This morning, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 12, as we talk about being witnesses for Christ. You know, one thing we think about, we think about our Lord Jesus Christ in His three years of ministry uh, you read about it in all the Gospels. He loved mountains. Much of our Lord's ministry took place on mountains. 
And if there's one mountain that really had a special place in the life of our Lord, it would have been uh, the Mount of Olives. Now, in Alabama, we'd call this a hill. (laughs) But in Jerusalem, uh, they call it a mount. It's 29 feet above sea level, 2,900 feet above sea level. And it is on the east side of the city of Jerusalem. And now, of course, there's all kind of shrines built on it in the modern day. But the Mount of Olives played a very special uh, part in the life of Jesus. It was here, uh, maybe somewhere in this vicinity, we don't know for sure, but on the slope of the Mount of Olives that Jesus taught his disciples in what we call the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 23 and in the other Gospels, he shared about his return. He went into detail about his second coming. And it was there on the Mount of Olives that he taught the Olivet Discourse. And then uh, down here is what we think is the site of the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed three times. God, let this cup of the cross pass from me, but nonetheless, thy will be done. And so somewhere here among the olive groves uh, was our Lord. This church that's built there is called the Church of All Nations that they've built there at the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Basilica of Agony is uh, there as well. And so somewhere in this vicinity perhaps was the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed before he went to the cross. And then in our text today, we're going to read about the ascension of Jesus, where after 40 days in his resurrected body, he ascended into the clouds back to the Father. That too took place on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Many believe it was somewhere in this vicinity at the peak of the Mount of Olives. This uh, steeple is the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Church of Ascension, where they believe it was there that the ascension took place. And, and according to the prophet, Zechariah the prophet tells us that when Jesus Christ returns, that he too is going to come back on the Mount of Olives. That when Jesus returns sometime in the future, that when he comes back in his body, he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives uh, is a place that if you ever get to go to the Holy Land, you want to be sure you visit the Mount of Olives because it played a very important part in the life of our Lord Jesus. Now, if you were up on this mountain and you're looking out toward the west, then you would see the city of Jerusalem. This picture was actually taken from the Mount of Olives. And, of course, this is modern-day Jerusalem. But when we think about Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, this is where the book of Acts begins. The book of Acts takes place for the first seven chapters. Everything we're going to read about the Acts of the Apostles takes place in the city of Jerusalem, which we have uh, a painting of on the wall here. And so Acts 1-8 gives us kind of an outline of the book of Acts. And this is the outline we'll follow in our study. But the outline of Acts in, in verse 1 8, it says that we're to be witnesses in Jerusalem. And so, for the first seven chapters, the apostles shared the gospel in Jerusalem, and the gospel spread in Jerusalem. And then Acts 1 8 says we're to be his witnesses in Judea and Samaria. So, in about chapter 8 through verse 12, we see the gospel begin to spread outside of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And then we're to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. And in chapter 13 of Acts, when Paul and Barnabas and uh, Silas and those went on their missionary journeys, they began to take the gospel to the ends of the earth all the way to the end of the book. And so this will be our our study, our outline of study. This morning, as we look at Acts 1, verse 4 through 12, uh, we'll see that Luke is telling us about the ascension of Jesus after he rose from the dead, he's on the Mount of Olives, and he gave his final instructions. The resurrected Jesus, after 40 days of walking on earth, gave his very final instructions to his disciples before he ascended in the clouds back into heaven. And so the main idea I want you to see with me this morning as we read God's Word is that the Holy Spirit empowers believers to be witnesses for Christ. Would you stand with me to honor the reading of the Word of God 
And follow along with me in your Bible as I read Acts 1, beginning with verse 4. After Luke said he presented himself alive in his resurrected body after suffering many, by many he proved himself alive after suffering by many proofs, he appeared to them for 40 days, speaking about the kingdom. Verse 4, and while staying with them, the disciples, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, John the Baptist baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but know this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight, and while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. Our Father, this teaching, these words, God, they just make our heart leap for joy. To see our Lord, your Son, resurrected and ascending back to you, Father, to your right hand where he intercedes and prays for us and him giving us your Holy Spirit. Oh God, there's much in these words. Teach us and feed us. As we look at your word this morning, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so the Holy Spirit empowers believers to be witnesses for Christ. That is the main thing that Jesus is leaving with them. And there are four things I want you to see with me that Jesus taught them there in his resurrected body on the day before he ascended to the Father. There are four things he taught them. Number one is this. He teaches that we will be baptized with His Spirit. Jesus said that believers, those of us who believe in Him, He's sharing this with those apostles, you will be baptized with the Spirit. Look at verse 4. While staying with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father was the promise of the the parakletos, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and for John baptized with water, John the Baptist baptized in water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. As a matter of fact, it was only like 10 days because Jesus Christ was resurrected during the Passover, and after Passover, there was 50 days to, to Pentecost. 50 days to Pentecost. And how long was Jesus alive on earth in his resurrected body? 40 days. So when he ascended, there was 10 more days before uh, this promise was fulfilled. So not many days, but 10 days later is when we'll read in, in, in the coming up about uh, Pentecost. The promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit is the wonderful promise that the Father and Jesus gave to us. You remember just a couple of weeks ago, we were studying the upper room discourse of Christ. Remember where after the Lord's Supper, Jesus intimately taught his disciples. And one of the main things he taught them in that upper room discourse was the promise of the Holy Spirit. And you'll remember, this is what he said to them, John 14, verse 16 and 17. He says, I'm going to ask the Father and he will give you another helper 
parakletos, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will be with you forever. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ascend back to the Father, but the Holy Spirit who I give you will never leave you. He will be with you forever. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. And this was the big difference. Because before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the Holy Spirit was still active. He worked with believers. He was working in the people who believed in God. But he never dwelled inside of them. He never became the person that lived inside of them. And Jesus said that after I go, when, when I send him, he will be in you. He will, be, he will take up residence inside of you, and your body will literally become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do in, of, in us? Well, many things, but one of the main things is he empowers us to be witnesses for Christ. In John 16, verse 7 and 8, Jesus said, still in that upper room discourse, uh, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I'm going away. It's to your advantage I'm going to send back to the Father. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. There's that promise. And when he comes, what's he going to do? He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so when we share the gospel... When we share the good news about Jesus, the Holy Spirit does the convicting. The Holy Spirit empowers our witness because as we share the good news of Christ and we share our testimony, the Holy Spirit convicts the world, those without Christ, of the, of the fact that they're sinners and of the fact that there is righteousness available through faith in Jesus and there's a judgment coming. The Holy Spirit does the convincing and the convicting. We do the sharing. And He even helps us in doing the sharing. In John 6, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. And so the truth is the good news of the gospel that we have the privilege of sharing. And so the Bible teaches us that when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will empower us to be witnesses. And we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. The second thing that Jesus said is that we must stay focused on his mission. And his mission is the salvation of the world. If you're not saved here today, if you've never given your life to Christ, you've never been baptized, his mission is to give you eternal life. His mission is to forgive your sins. You have to do your part. You have to believe in Him. But the mission of Christ is the salvation of the world. That's why He died on the cross. That was His mission. He died on the cross for all of us who have sinned so that by His blood our sins could be forgiven and by His resurrection we could be given new life. And that's our testimony. And so our mission is His mission. He did His part. His part was to make the gospel possible, to make it possible for sinners to be forgiven, to be saved, and have eternal life. And then he gave the church our part. Our part is to tell the world this wonderful news, to share with people about what he did and how we can all have life through him. And we have to stay focused on this mission because sometimes it's easy to get distracted. Immediately in our text, the disciples get distracted. They often got distracted. Notice their very first question. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Here we go again. I mean, this has kind of been their motif. When they followed him, they thought Jesus had come to set up an earthly kingdom. But he came to make everybody rich and powerful on earth, and Israel was going to be restored as the great leader of the world. And Jesus kept telling them, no, that's, 
not my kingdom is not on earth. Well, now they think since he died, since he's risen, well, now this must be the time. And so Jesus says to them, it is not for you to know this. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has, notice this word, has fixed by his own authority, by his own sovereignty. He said, this is not for us to know this time. In other words, the Father God has fixed the times and seasons. When Jesus Christ was born in a manger in Bethlehem, for many, many years the Jews were waiting on their Messiah, wondering when's he going to come. And, and it, was, it was a time fixed by the Father that in the fullness of time, Christ was born in a manger, born in a, of a virgin. That was God's perfect timing. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, that was God's perfect timing. When he rose from the dead, that was a time fixed by the Father. That was God's perfect timing. And there is a time yet to come. There is a time out there in the future, maybe in our future, when our Lord Jesus is coming again to the Mount of Olives. He is returning to earth. But we don't know. That is a time fixed by the sovereignty and the authority of the Father. We don't know when that time's coming, but we know that it's coming. Amen? Let me show you something interesting. Times, th let's talk about times and seasons. The Jews had seven feasts that they were required to keep by law. There eventually became nine feasts, but seven original feasts. Now, three of their seven feasts, that they, they were required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Every male Jewish man uh, had to take his family on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and three times a year they would take their family to Jerusalem for these three feasts. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 says this is required by law that every Jewish man must uh, go back to Jerusalem and celebrate these feasts. The first was Passover, or we sometimes refer to it as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The second one was Pentecost, or sometimes we refer uh, to that one uh, as uh, the Feast of uh, Weeks, and then Tabernacles, which we refer to often as the, the Feast of Booths. So when you read in Scripture about the Feast of Booths, that's Tabernacle, the Feast of Weeks, that means 49 weeks from, Pente from Passover, which 50 days, and then Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now I want you to think about this. I want you to realize that Passover is the, is the feast that most represented the suffering of Jesus, His death, because it was when the Jews were in bondage to Egypt that the last plague God brought on the Egyptians that resulted in Pharaoh letting the children of Israel leave Egypt and be set free from bondage was the, the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the blood of the lamb put over the doorpost of the home, and it was because of their faith in the blood of that lamb that they were set free. Now that was God's sovereign way of showing all of us the beautiful death and sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And do you realize that in God's fixed time, God's fixed time, it was on the day of, pa it was during Passover, on the very day that the Jews were sacrificing their sacrificial lambs for Passover, that Jesus Christ was crucified. On that very day on that very day. And then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. A part of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was the Feast of First Fruits. During that seven days of Unleavened Bread, they celebrated First Fruits. It was on the very day of the celebration of First Fruits that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now I want you to think about that. Of all the times the Jews wanted to arrest Jesus and they couldn't, I mean, there were times they wanted to take him by force, and the Bible says he slipped through their midst. How did he slip through their midst? Because it wasn't God's time. And the very time they did not want to crucify him, 
was during Passover. And that was the time they crucified him. As a matter of fact, they crucified him on the very day people all over Jerusalem were sacrificing their own sacrificial lambs. And then three days later, he rose on the very day of the celebration of first fruits. Because Jesus Christ was, according to Paul, the first fruits of all of us who are going to rise from the dead. After Passover, how many days was it from Passover to Pentecost? 50 days. Pentecost is 50 days. 49 weeks. And so at the end of 49 weeks, they would celebrate uh, Passover. And this Passover was uh, the, the feast of weeks, the feast of, of harvest, the, the first harvest, the first fruits. And they would celebrate the, the giving of their first fruits. They also celebrated the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Jewish law to Moses. When the Jews were delivered from Egyptian bondage out of Egypt, their belief was that in 50 days, it was when Moses was on Mount Sinai. From the Red Sea to Mount Sinai was 50 days. When God gave the law, the Torah. And, and so Pentecost, they, sep- they celebrated the giving of the law. What was God's fixed time to give to us the Holy Spirit? On the very day of Pentecost, Jesus lived 40 days. Ten days later, he said, go wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit to us as New Testament believers is God's answer to the law. Because the law proved itself to be insufficient to change the hearts. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live within our heart, what does he do? He writes the law of God on our heart. We're no longer under the bondage of the law, but we are set free by the power of the Holy Spirit to live for God. And beloved, that happened at Pentecost. Now these two feasts were in the spring, so you had to go through the whole summer, and then late in the fall, you celebrate, you celebrate, they celebrated tabernacles. Tabernacles was their celebrating how God provided for them as they wandered through the wilderness. They lived in booths. And so it was the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And then at the end of, of that, they went into the Promised Land. And so Tabernacles is where we are now. We're the church. We are tabernacling with God. We're we're not in the promised land yet. And so we tabernacle with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us. But there is a day coming when we will enter into the promised land and God takes care of us while we're here. This is yet prophetically to be fulfilled. I, I truly believe that in God's fixed time, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I do believe when he comes back, it's going to be at Tabernacles. Why? Because, well, he came, on, he, he was crucified on Passover. He rose, uh, he gave the Spirit on Pentecost. Why not think he's coming back at Tabernacles? You know, what an awesome opportunity to share our gospel with those who are Jewish, with those who may not realize yet the Messiah. All of their feasts point to the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, here's how this applies to us, church. Between Pentecost and Tabernacles, we have a job to do. And we're not to be distracted from our job. We're to remember what our job is. I love prophecy. I love to study it, preach it. But as much as I love prophecy, I'm never to get so bound up in prophecy that I forget what my main job is. What is my main mission? What is our main mission, church? To be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Between Pentecost and Tabernacles, that's our job. In, in, in every gospel, we, we get our commission. In Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If you follow me, you're going to go out and seek to get other men, other women to follow me. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we call this the Great Commission. Jesus said, go therefore and do what? Make disciples of whom? Of all nations. And when you lead somebody to faith, baptize them like we saw this morning. 
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then you teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And what did he just command us? Make disciples. So it's a reciprocal, reproducible process of making disciples, multiplying, and making more. That's our job. He said, I'll be with you to the end of the age as you do this. Mark said it like this. In Mark's gospel, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news, the gospel, to the whole creation. Or some translations say to every creature. <laughs> to every creature that moves, share the good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from our sin. Saved from separation from God for all eternity. But what, whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then Luke, in Luke's gospel, Luke puts it like this. Luke 24, 46 and 47. He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And so, beloved church, how can we be distracted from our mission? Do you understand it? Do you realize what your mission is? I don't think Jesus could have made it more clear. Our mission is his great commission. Our mission is to share the gospel, to share the good news to everybody. Well, the third thing I want you to see with me is this. If that's our mission, then we will receive power for this mission. We will receive power to be His witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes, He does a lot of things. I mean, when He comes, He gives us life. He transforms us from dead to being spiritually alive. He begins to grow fruit, spiritual fruit in our life. He gives us spiritual gifts. But according to Jesus Christ, the one main thing, the one main thing the Spirit does is He empowers us to be witnesses for Christ. Acts 1.8. This may be the key verse in the whole book of Acts. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Greek word for power is the word dunamis. And it is the word from which we have the English word dynamite. Back in uh, the 19th century, there was a Swedish chemist named Alfred Bernhard Noble. And Alfred Bernhard Noble discovered a substance that was the most powerful substance ever discovered up to that time. And uh, he had a friend who was a Greek scholar. And he asked the Greek scholar, he said, what is, uh, what is the Greek word for explosion? What is the Greek word for powerful explosion? And his Greek friend said, it's the word dunamis. And he said, well, then my substance will be called dynamite. And that's where we got the name dynamite. And what the Bible is saying is all of us who are saved, all of us who have the Holy Spirit, we have explosive power within us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. So he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So you begin there, and then you'll be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This was the plan. And so uh, the word witnesses is the Greek word martus, from which we have the English word martyr. You see, in the early church, they took this seriously. As we read in the book of Acts, when they received the Holy Spirit, what they do? They started powerfully witnessing for Christ. As they witnessed, the Christianity began to spread. The Roman government turned against believers. Many of them began to be persecuted and put to death because of their witness. So their witness was so powerful, even unto death, that they began to refer to those that died for their faith as martyrs because they were witnesses for Jesus Christ. 
And, and, and the word witness is a ver as a verb or noun is used 29 times in the book of Acts. It's a major theme in the book of Acts. So notice, Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends of the earth. In our witness, we begin where we are, in our Jerusalem. Where is our Jerusalem? Our Jerusalem is our family, our friends, our neighbors, our classmates at school, the people that we go to work with. This is our Jerusalem. This is where God, the Lord, has called you and I to be witnesses. We are to share our faith with those in our inner circle, our family, our friends, the people we work with, the people that we go to school with. We're to share Christ with them. And then we expand to nearby areas. That's our Judea and our Samaria. We, we go out of our inner circle to nearby areas to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then ultimately we go to the end of the earth, to the end of the earth to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Look at this picture. It's like concentric circles. We begin with our Jerusalem, then we expand to Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. As a pastor, I'm so thankful I guess I would want to use the word proud in a nice way, not in a worldly way, but in a godly way. I wanted to say I'm so proud of our church. When I think about our Jerusalem, I, I think about the ministries we're doing right here in our area, and, and I think about John Gibson and Stephen Shelton. I, I think about Serving You Ministries, a ministry that was birthed out of our church, a ministry that started small and God has blessed it, and now we have a building down on First Avenue where we are ministering to people that have needs. We share the gospel with everyone who walks in the doors. We've had the privilege of leading many to Christ. We're making a difference. Many of you volunteer. Many of you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and you serve and you give out food and you share the gospel, and that is a ministry that we love, adore, we're involved in. I think about Bubba Leonard and how God called him out to go and be the director of Oak Tree Ministries in one of the hardest areas of our city, Gate City, where some people would not dare to go. Bubba is leading a ministry there, making a difference. I shared with, talked with Bubba a couple weeks ago, and they do kids' clubs after school, and they're growing. He's running out of room. He's sharing the gospel with kids. He's beginning to engage families. This summer, we'll have a lot of activity down there. He needs volunteers. We need to volunteer. This is our Jerusalem. I think about D-Life and discipleship groups that continue to multiply and engage the lost right here in, in our church that's just like what we read. It's multiplying, it's spreading, it's growing. This week, I heard about one of our D-groups that has an atheist coming so-called atheist. Now she's got a Bible, reading her Bible every day, doesn't want to miss. When she first started, she thought she was an atheist. I mean, these are all the ways that we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in our Jerusalem. When I think about Judea and Samaria, man, we just heard a powerful testimony, did we not? Of our students, 145 students and adults going to Tampa, and all week long, they didn't go there to play. They went there to share Christ and led children to the Lord. Families are coming to churches. I mean, that's one example of our Judea and our Samaria. And every year we take go tours and family mission trips, and, and we, we share Christ in our Judea and Samaria. And then to the ends of the world, I think about Jimmy Agnew. I think about how every year he leads two mission trips to Mexico where we partner with mega missions and we build churches and we do hospital uh, medical missions there. We do that every year. I think about Chris Bond with Designs for Hope, birthed out of our family. We support, we love, we value what Chris is doing, using engineering to provide for missionaries in the third world, taking trips to the third world, to the ends of the earth. I, I think about 
Mallory Herring in Ecuador. We'll be taking a trip to Ecuador this year with her orphanage. I think about Robert and Laura Vitter, who grew up in our church, who are in Italy. Uh, and we're taking a trip to Italy this year to help them. I think about Caitlin, who was in Oman, who's praying about where she's going next. We took a trip to Oman. I think about how D-Life is spreading now in six different countries, in Ecuador, Guatemala, Colombia. We will in the future be having partnerships with those countries, training them in disciple making. I mean, this is all going on right here in our body. And this is exactly what Jesus taught us to do in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We are to be his witness. In the old day, it used to be referred to as soul winning. That was the terminology. You, you were encouraged to be a soul winner. I like that, old, that word because souls need to be one to Jesus. We need to share the gospel and see souls one to Jesus. A few years later, we called it sharing the gospel. Go share the good news. Just look for an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with someone who needs hope. The new terminology that you hear a lot now is having gospel conversations. Look for opportunities to have gospel conversations. I like that. That's a great way to put it. Look for opportunities to have a gospel conversation with somebody. Talk to your family and friends and just say, hey, can I, can I share with you about my faith? Can I just take a moment and share with you about my faith and what God is doing in my life? Can I share my testimony with you? I mean, we as a church should be looking for opportunities to have gospel conversations every single week that we live. Last Sunday, our church was packed to capacity. It's pretty packed today. Last Sunday, there was not a seat in either service. I would love to see it that way every week, amen? And if we would do our job, we could see it that way every week. If we would look for opportunities every week, teenagers and adults to share Christ, to share about what God's doing, to share about the good things the Lord is doing in our lives and our church, we could fill this up and have to have more services and more services. This is what God has called us to do. Let's do our job. Paul put it like this in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You're not ashamed of the gospel, are you? Never be ashamed of the gospel. Let's share the gospel with our lips. In Colossians 4, 5, and 6, Paul said, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Outsiders is not a bad word. It doesn't mean they're weird. It just means they're outside the church. They're not in church. They don't know the Lord. Walk in wisdom. Make the best use of your time. Let your speech be seasoned with grace. Our job's not to turn them away by harsh, condemning words, but with grace, with salt. We want to, uh, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person, how you can answer their questions and share the gospel with them. 1 Peter 5, 13, in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared, always looking for an opportunity to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. And you do it how? With gentleness and with respect. You respectfully, gently give a defense. Why, are you, why do you have this hope in you of heaven, of forgiveness, of knowing God? Let me tell you about that hope. It all comes from Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are to be his witness. Well, the last thing we'll close with this is we have a job to do until his return. How long are we to do this job? <laughs> How long are we to share the gospel? Until Christ returns. Look at verse 9. I like, I like this. I think this is funny. When he, when he had said these things, when Jesus said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. That's what we call the ascension of Christ. After 40 days in his resurrected body on the Mount of Olives, he ascended up into a cloud back to the Father. What would you have done if you had been there? 
I'm sure you would have stared as long as you could, right? I mean, you'd have been in such awe and amazement and bewilderment. it. You would have just kept looking up at, to see if you could see him. And, and as they were looking up, it says, while they were gazing into the heavens, as Jesus went up, then two men, which were angels, probably the same two that came to the garden tomb when Jesus was resurrected and said, what are you, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Here these two men have another question. These two angels came, they were in white robes, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? In other words, they're saying, don't you have a job to do? I mean, didn't Christ give you a commission don't stand here gazing into heaven because this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. He's coming back in a cloud. And until then, you have an urgent job to do. Share the good news about his death, burial, and resurrection. There's urgency in this job we have an urgent job to do i pray as a church that we would be empowered filled by the holy spirit of god to have gospel conversation to share the good news to lead others to christ because jesus is coming back matthew 24 30 these are the words of jesus he spoke these words on the mount of olives Jesus said, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Just like they saw him go in the clouds, he's coming back in the clouds. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and wail. On account of him, even so, say it with me. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus is coming again. There's a time fixed by the Father. We don't know when he's coming. In my heart, I feel like he could be coming soon. And I have a job to do. I pray we would do our job. So many people today are looking for a warm, fuzzy, comfortable church where they can just be glory gazers, just stare into glory, no commitment, just come and enjoy. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a church that's willing to roll up their sleeves and go out into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and share the gospel of Jesus Christ till Jesus comes. C.T. Studd was a 20th century missionary and, and he, he said that we need to remember the very last words of Jesus. You know what the six last words of Jesus were? The six last words of Jesus to the end of the earth. To the end of the earth. C.T. Studd said, some want to live within the sound of the church or the chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And I would say to us today, we need more studs in the church. Amen? We have enough duds. Duds without power. Duds who never want to share their faith. Duds who want to come to church to hear a warm, fuzzy sermon and have their ears tickled and hear about your best life now, who, who want to come and just be uh, in a place where there's no commitment. Bubba, you're in the wrong church. That's not what we, we want to run a rescue shop on the gate of hell. We, we want to learn how to take the power of the Holy Spirit and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to be more like a stud than a dud for Jesus Christ. And so I ask you this morning, do you understand your mission? How could we not? I mean, if you read the Bible, it is absolutely as clear as anything can be. Are you doing your job? Many people here 
would say, you know what, I've never shared my faith with one person. I've never, uh, my, I'm, li- I'm in a school of lost students, and I can go to Tampa and share my faith, but I've never shared my faith with my classmate. Guys, we need to share Christ in our schools. We have kids destroying their lives. Mom and dad, are you an example for them? Are your children learning how to share their faith because they see you share your faith? Are we doing our job? What are you waiting for? The Holy Spirit has empowered you to share your faith. What are you waiting for? The time for us to start is now. Would you bow with me? As we bow our hearts before God the Father, maybe what some of you are waiting for is you've never received Christ. You've never put your faith in Christ as your Lord. You've never received that great power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, this morning, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to invite you to come to Christ. Oh, I want to invite you to come to Him today. He died for you. He rose for you. He loves you. His mission was to save you. He will forgive you and give you new life. But you have to believe in Him. You have to trust Him. You have to repent and put your faith in Christ. In a moment, we're all going to stand in worship. And I'm going to stand right here. And if you want to come to Christ, I invite you to come and take me by the hand. And say, Pastor, I'm ready. I don't know what I've waited for for so long. I've never been more ready in my life to do this. But I want to give my life to Christ. Let me pray with you. Let's pray together and let you voice to Him your desire to have Him in your life. Come. Don't let Satan, don't let hell, don't let anything keep you. Come from the balcony or the floor. I invite you to come to Christ. If you've already come to Christ and you're a believer, are you doing your job? Are you leading people to Christ? Maybe you need to come this morning and just get on your knees at this altar and say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for my cowardice. Forgive me for getting distracted. Forgive me for wanting to to live a warm, fuzzy life when you've called me to charge the gates of hell. Maybe some of you need to come and recommit your life. Join our family. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do, when we stand to sing, let's worship God and let's listen to what the Holy Spirit leads us to do. I'll be here. The altar is open. Father, oh God, I pray you speak to hearts this morning. God, there's someone here today who needs Christ in their heart. They know Him. And I pray that nothing can stop them. I pray that they'll come and today will be the day they give their life to Jesus. God, I pray that believers will be open to Your Spirit, convicting and encouraging. And God, that we would respond by coming to the altar or joining our church or whatever You lead us to do. God, as we worship You, Holy Spirit, fall on us. And lead us to do what you would have us do in Jesus' name.